But today we're looking at the demon-possessed slave girl. She's Paul's second European convert. You know, when they, when they left Troas and they crossed the sea and, and they went over to Macedonia, they had left Asia and had gone into Europe and they were the first Christian missionaries to take the story of the gospel to the continent of Europe. And, and we already studied about Lydia, the first European continent, um, convert on the continent of Europe. And today we're going to study about this demon-possessed slave girl. We don't even know her name, but we know her story. Well, let's look at a text verse, Acts chapter 16, verse number 16. Luke wrote, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. I love the way that verse starts. Now it happened. Life just happens, doesn't it? I mean, you're just kind of going about your business, doing life, hopefully, the way God wants you to do life, and then stuff just happens. The unexpected, the unexplained, it just happens. And, and the, the issue is not really, is stuff going to happen? The issue is, how prepared are we to deal with stuff when it does happen? And I want to show you that from this section of, skip, of Scripture. The, the section of the book of Acts that, that we're going to examine today introduces us to, as I said, Paul's second European convert, this demon-possessed slave girl. Luke began the story of her conversion with the verse that we just read. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Now in order to understand the story about this slave girl, we need to accurately answer a couple of important questions. I'm, I'm amazed as I study through the scriptures and it, and it, it just occurs to me again and again and again that in order to understand this, you have to know the answer to this question. And I think that's why so often Jesus taught by asking questions. Did you ever notice that as you read through the four Gospels? He would ask a question and then he would give a Bible lesson. And it's because they really needed the answer to their question in order to understand what life was really all about. And so he taught by asking questions. And I want to remind you of this. God never asked a question to get an answer. Are you aware of that? He already has all the answers. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. He never asked a question because he needs information. He asked a question because we need information. And so when I ask you these questions, I often do it because we need the information that's behind the answer to the question. And so here are a couple of questions. The first question is, who were these evil spirits? This gal was possessed with the spirit of divination. An evil spirit. So who were these evil spirits? And, and then the second question is, where did they come from? And, and to answer these questions, we need to review some important biblical background material. Now what I'm about to tell you is not related to the story itself, but I have to tell you this so that you can fully comprehend what happens in the story. Because if I don't tell you this, you're going to be scratching your head and saying, now I'm not sure if I really believe in these demons or not. I'm not sure if I really believe that there is an evil side of the spiritual world. After all, if that really is true, where did they come from? And, and, and why are they here? And, and, and what's this all about? And so that's what I want to give you, uh, the answer to those two questions. Number one, who are they? Who are these evil spirits? Both the Old Testament and the New Testament documents the reality of these evil spirits. We commonly call them demons or devils. During his ministry on earth, Jesus repeatedly encountered these spirit creatures. You can't read through the four Gospels without seeing that every time Jesus turned around, he runs into some kind of an activity that is being evil activity, being caused by a demon, and he casts the demon out. Matthew wrote this. It is in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 16. Just an example of Jesus running into some of these spirits. When evening came... Many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. You see, he had been doing this great healing ministry, and, and, and a lot of people knew that he was healing people by casting demons out of them. And so when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits. He drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. Sometimes sickness is the result of demonic acti activity. Not always. But sometimes that's the, that's the cause of the particular ailment that somebody has. And we can see that here because he drove out the spirits with a word. I love that. 
All it took was one word from Jesus and the demons began to flee. He, he drove out the demons with a word. And what was the result? These sick people were healed. That means that the demon was somehow connected with the sickness. The demon was trying to destroy them through the sickness. In Scripture, demons are consistently portrayed as evil spirits seeking to infiltrate and take control of the bodies of human beings in an effort to destroy them. That's what they're all about. Demons are spirits that want to infiltrate your body and they want to get in control of your body so that they can destroy you. They are evil, and they are just like their master, the devil, whose mode of operation is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. A clear example of this fact is recorded by Matthew when he wrote this story in Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 to 18. It said, when they came to the crowd, Jesus and and Peter and James and John had been up on the mountain. Jesus had been transfigured before them. He had given them a glimpse of what he was going to look like in his glory when he comes back in his kingdom. And then he said, now don't tell anybody about it. How would you like to have been given that assignment? You have seen Jesus glorified. You have got great news to tell people. You can't wait to describe what you have seen, what it's going to be like when we all get to heaven. And then he says, oh, by the way, don't tell anybody. How would you like that kind of an excitement or of an assignment? But that's exactly what he did for them. And they're coming back down the mountain. And when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. In that story, I think we can see that this demon had obviously taken control of the boy's body. He was able to determine where the boy went and what the boy did. He was throwing him into the fire. He was throwing him into the water in an obvious attempt to destroy him. And that's why I tell you that the object of the demon is to infiltrate a body, a human body, and then destroy that person. That's the agenda of the demonic world. Now, the next question is, where do they come from? Where do these evil spirits come from? And in order to accurately answer this question, we need to go all the way back to the book of Genesis in the very beginning and briefly review what the Bible teaches about creation. I'm not going to give you a whole lengthy discussion of creation. Many of you have already heard me teach about creation, but I want to just give you some highlights about creation so that you can understand where these demons come from. So we go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That's how God starts the whole story. In the beginning, God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. Now in order to correctly understand these two verses, we need to know that in the Hebrew language, here's some background information, in the Hebrew language, there are no being verbs. You know what being verbs are, don't you? is, am, are, was, were, uh, uh, verbs that just talk about the state of being, that just say something existed. In Hebrew, there are no being verbs. If there's a being verb in a Hebrew sentence, you'd have to supply it just because it would be there. But there are no being verbs in the Hebrew language. And, and therefore, we need to examine this phrase in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2, the first part of the verse. Now the earth was formless and empty. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Now, the, 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 the problem with that verse is that there is a being verb in it, right? Was. But the issue is that there is a word there that actually is the verb. And since there are no being verbs in Hebrew, we can be sure that that Hebrew verb in that verse is not a being verb like was. It's actually a different word. 
The Hebrew word translated was is actually haya, which means nothing to you. And literally, it means became. It is, it is a Hebrew verb that describes a change of condition. The earth became without form and void or formless and empty. That's the way it really should read from a literal translation. It, it, it reads, now the earth became formless and empty. And it denotes a change of condition. The creation that God created in verse number one was in one condition, but after verse number two, it's in a totally different condition. Now it's formless and empty. The same Hebrew verb is used to describe what happened to Lot's wife. Do you remember the story of Lot's wife? When she looked back at Sodom and Gomorrah longingly, do you remember what happened to her? What was it? She became a pillar of salt, right? And, and that's what the scripture says. Genesis 19, verse 26. Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. It's the same Hebrew verb used in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2, that should be translated, and the earth became formless and empty, denoting a change of condition. Did Lot's wife change condition the moment she looked back? In one moment, she was a living, breathing, warm-bodied, pulsating individual, and the next moment, she was a stiff, lifeless, cold pillar of salt, a total change in condition. That's what happened to the earth between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. It was a wonderful, beautiful, perfect creation created to be inhabited. God had done a wonderful work there and then something happened after verse number 1 that caused Moses to write and now the earth became formless and empty, a total change in condition. A total change in condition. The cosmic event that virtually destroyed God's original creation is commonly called the angelic conflict. There was a conflict among the angels. In fact, there was actually a war in heaven because Satan, Lucifer, and his angels decided that they were going to leave their assigned place of ministry in God's order of things. And by the way, we don't have time to get into this, but their assigned place was earth. Lucifer was originally the caretaker of the earth. He decided that wasn't good enough. He was going to march he, himself and his army of angels with him up into heaven, declare war on God, dethrone God, and become God himself. That was his agenda. As a result of that, he was thrown out of heaven. And when he was thrown out of heaven, the, the, the sheer power and force of God throwing him out of heaven and smacking him back down to the earth caused the earth to become formless and empty. Let's read about that. That, that story is recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. The prophet said, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground? You see, he was thrown out and he came and he was smacked down on the earth. Cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. God thinks he's got it all under control. I'm going to be God. That's what the devil was thinking when he was Lucifer, an archangel. Jesus described this same event when he said this in Luke chapter 10, verse number 18, I saw, this is Jesus telling his disciples what he had seen in eternity past before he was ever born as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. When he was with the Father in eternity past, he said this, I saw Satan like lightning fall. From heaven. You see, Jesus verified it. He said, I was there. I saw God throw him out. It looked like a lightning bolt striking planet Earth when Satan was thrown out. And when he fell like lightning from heaven, the result was the virtual destruction of God's original creation. And that's why Moses wrote, now the earth was, or now the earth became formless and empty in Genesis 1-2. 
And then God spent six days reconstructing his formless and empty world. And that story is recorded in the rest of Genesis chapter 1, in the six days of creation. There are actually six days of reconstruction. God rebuilding the creation on the ruins of that ancient creation that was destroyed during this conflict among the angels. And this rebuilt world is the world in which we live today. God created the original world to be inhabited. That world that he created in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He, he created that original world to be inhabited. And we know that because Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 45, 18, Thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. God created that original creation to be inhabited, and the logical implication is that he also created creatures to inhabit it. There were living creatures who inhabited that original creation. We don't know exactly what kind of creatures inhabited the original world, but the fact is that it was created to be inhabited, and that fact provides a logical explanation for the prehistoric fossils that are buried deep beneath the surface of the world in which we live. They call them, and this is no accident, prehistoric animals. We find the fossil remains of prehistoric life. What does that mean? What does prehistoric mean? Before history. Before the history of the planet, before the history of the world that we live on, the rebuilt creation, there was an ancient creation, and that ancient creation had life on it, and we dig up these fossils that we have no record of being on the creation that we live on because they are silent reminders that there was an original creation that God spoke about in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created it to be inhabited. And we need to remember that. We need to understand, because that's vitally important to answering the question, where did they come from? Where did they come from? When God's original creation was suddenly destroyed during this angelic conflict, the bodies of those prehistoric creatures were destroyed. That's why we find the fossil remains of them. And their spirits were left in a disembodied state. You see, they were created with a spirit and a body. The body was destroyed, and the spirits then are left in a disembodied state. They're, they're left in a state where they have no body. These disembodied spirits of a prehistoric race of creatures are the demons who roam around in the world today. In the world in which we live today, looking for bodies to inhabit. You see... By nature, they were created to have a body. They are not complete. They do not feel fulfilled. They don't feel whole unless they have a body. And if they don't have a body and they need a body and they want a body, what are they looking for? A body. And that's why all through Scripture, when you read about demons, what are they doing? And they have infiltrated the body of some human being and they have taken control of that body. In fact, they can't find rest until they have infiltrated and taken control of a body. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places. I wish I had time to talk to you about that, but I don't, so we'll move on. He goes through the dry places seeking rest. He's been cast out of a man. Now what's he looking for? Rest. But what happens? He finds none. They can't rest unless they're in a body. So Jesus says, you cast one out of a man, and what happens? He goes to the dry places, he goes to the desert, the arid places, and he's trying to find rest, but he can't find any rest. And that's why Jesus tells another story about when you cast the demon out of a man, if the Holy Spirit doesn't come in and inhabit that body, then that demon, not being able to find any rest, will say, let's go back to the to the place from which we came. Let's go back to that body that we came out of and see if we can get back in there. And he comes back and he finds it empty and kind of cleaned up, but no new inhabitant. The Holy Spirit hasn't moved in. And so he comes back and infiltrates that body again, brings seven demons with him, worse than himself. And the last condition of that man is worse than his original condition. Do you get that? They're always looking for a body to inhabit. Well, it was one of these evil 
unclean spirits that infiltrated and took control of the body of the slave girl in today's story from the book of Acts. You see, I had to tell you all of that before we could even get to the story. So you'll understand who these demons are and why they operate like they do and why would this demon want to take control of this poor slave girl. Well, let's talk about the slave girl. There are two significant facts to notice about this slave girl. First, she was possessed with a spirit of divination. And second, she was engaged in fortune telling. So I want us to briefly examine exactly what each of these things means. Let's talk about a spirit of divination. Divination, the root word there is divine. Because many ancient civilizations, when they came in contact with these demons, and the demons have supernatural power, you can't read the New Testament without getting that, they thought that they were gods. They thought that they were divine. And should that come to any surprise to us? Paul answered that, didn't he, when he wrote to the Corinthians? And he said, should you be surprised if these demons masquerade as angels of light? He said, after all, Satan does that. He disguises himself as an angel of light. Why wouldn't his demons do the same? So, so they, in, in their spiritual darkness, they concluded that these, that these evil spirits were actually divine, and so they would call them a spirit of divine nature, a spirit of divination. Now, I want you to know that there are different kinds of evil spirits. When Jesus' disciples were unable to drive an evil spirit from a tormented boy, they asked Jesus, why couldn't we drive it out? And I, I'm amazed. If you don't want the real answer to a question, don't ask Jesus because he will tell you whether you want to hear it or not. You know, sometimes I kind of wince because I, I'm in a position where I have to tell people something I don't really want to tell them, but they ask. And I, I'm constrained to tell them the answer even when they don't want to hear it. And, and, so, and so they come to Jesus and they ask, why couldn't, why couldn't we drive it out? They had tried to drive the demon out of this boy and they couldn't drive it out. They didn't have the spiritual power to do it. And they came to Jesus and said, why can't we do it? And, and Jesus gave this answer in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. This kind, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, do you get that? In a roundabout way, what he said was, you're not praying the way you ought to pray and you're not fasting the way you ought to fast. If you were, you could have done that. You've been able to drive out other demons, but this kind is tougher than the others that you've been confronted with and you can't drive it out because your prayer life is lax and your fasting is irregular. Isn't that what he told them? But the important part is this kind. What does that indicate? There are different kinds, right? They had been able to cast out other demons, but they couldn't cast out this kind. And so there are different kinds of demons. And Luke described the particular kind of evil spirit that had infiltrated the body of this slave girl when he wrote that text verse in Acts 16, 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us. That word divination is translated from a Greek word which means to foresee. It means to be able to see ahead in time. To practice divination is to reveal hidden knowledge about the future by supernatural means. The spirit that had possessed this slave girl enabled her to do exactly that. She was able to predict what was going to happen in people's future. What do we call that? Fortune telling. Isn't that still going on in the world today? There are a lot of people who claim that power. Many of them are fakes. Many of them are frauds. Many of them give you such vague answers that it could happen to anybody, and so a portion of the time they're right. But, but some of them have been infiltrated by and are being controlled by a spirit of divination that gives them the ability to accurately predict what's going to happen in the future, and we call it fortune-telling. And she was able to do that. And she was so good at it that she brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. There were some Jewish businessmen who saw that as an opportunity to make some money. And so they bought her 
and commercialized her demon possession to make themselves an exorbitant amount of money. So let's talk about fortune telling. Let's talk about fortune telling. We commonly call divination fortune telling. Luke described this girl as a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. From ancient times, people have used divination to get knowledge about the future. I mean, you can't read through the Old Testament without seeing that. And, and, and it, it's practiced by people today who claim supernatural power to reveal the future. And they use all kinds of means to do it. Bottom line, if they can really do it, it's from a spirit of divination. It's an evil spirit. It's demonic activity. They, they do it by reading palms. You know, there's, they say, read the lines in your palm. I guess my fortune's changing all the time because as I age, the lines are different and more numerous. Any, any of you have that? More lines? No, I won't ask you that. Um, but anyway, there's this, they do that palm reading. What about reading tea leaves? You know, where they pour ground up tea leaves out and they read the tea leaves or tarot cards or, or zodiac signs. The zodiac signs and astrology and that kind of thing published in a lot of major newspapers because such a, a large number of people in our current culture don't understand that if you really want to know about your future, you need to get that information from God, not from any other source. And so they, they use all these things. It's nothing more than either an act or if it's real, it's demonic activity. There are evil spirits who can give people this supernaturally, supernatural ability to practice divination, to predict the future, to have knowledge that they should not reasonably be able to have. It's real. And this slave girl brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. But you know what I love about this story? Jesus is greater than any demon. Paul kind of lost his cool. I'm so glad that God can work through you even when you lose your cool, aren't you? Paul kind of lost his cool because this girl is following them around day after day saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who come to show you know, us the way of salvation. And she's saying that again and again. And the devil's smart. He, she was telling the truth, wasn't she? The devil will tell the truth if he can use it to discredit you. You see, the people in that town knew that she had an evil spirit, knew that she had this supernatural power. And, and by her giving a good reference to the apostles, it would appear to the people in this town that they were in league with this evil spirit. And so Paul didn't want his testimony dirtied up by thinking that he was connected with the same power she was connected with. And so in a moment of frustration, he turned to her and he said to the demon, Come out of her! And the demon came out with a shriek. And her supernatural ability to predict the future was gone and her masters understood that their business had just been dashed. And so they have Paul arrested, beaten, and thrown into prison, which brings us to the next story. But what I want you to get is that God's view of divination was revealed by Moses. When he wrote this, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to read some excerpts from verse 10 and then down in verse number 12. God summed it up way back in the early days of the nation of Israel. He summed it up. This is how God feels about trying to draw supernatural power from any source other than him. Let no one be found among you. And what does he mean when he says, let no one be found among you? Don't tolerate this in your culture. What he's actually saying is, as far as God is concerned, this is a capital crime. Do you know what a capital crime is? A, cr a crime that should be punishable by the death penalty. Let no one be found among you who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, and then he goes ahead and lists several other things. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. There's that word again. Detestable to the Lord. So you see, divination or any other kind of demonic supernatural activity 
divination is detestable to the Lord. Now, I want to give you this. If you have ever consulted with a fortune teller, or had your palm read, or relied on zodiac signs, or used an Ouija board, those used to be common. When I was a, a kid and a teenager, those were pretty common. Or, or if you've participated in a seance, I have to confess, when I was a child, we had seances. Fortunately, they weren't real. We never contacted anybody. You know, a seance is the uh, attempt to communicate with the dead. And you say, oh, that's ridiculous. Read your Old Testament. There's a word in your Old Testament called necromancy. And that word is nothing more than the word we use for a seance. And, and there's a clear biblical example in the Old Testament of somebody being able to communicate with the dead. Do you remember King Saul and the witch of Endor? They communicated with a dead prophet. And sometimes I teach that and they say, oh no, that's just a story. <laughs> it is a story, but when God puts a story in the Bible, it's true. It was just a story, but it was a true story to warn us that there are these supernatural powers that are available from the evil side of the spiritual world and they're dangerous and they're detestable to God and it's the devil's way of trying to infiltrate people and getting control of them and keep them from being what God wants them to be and ultimately to destroy them. That's what this demonic activity is all about. And so if you have ever done any of that, if you've ever done any of that in an attempt to learn about your future, then you need to confess to the Lord and seek His forgiveness because these things are detestable to the Lord. John wrote this, and here's why I tell you you need to do that. John wrote, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I am so glad that he put that one little three-letter word in there, aren't you? If we confess, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. Including the sin of divination. I've seen people delivered from demonic influences when they finally confessed and repented of and were forgiven of the sin of divination or some other kind of demonic sin that gave the devil a foothold in their lives. So what I'm telling you you need to do today, if you've ever been involved in any of that like this slave girl was, you need to understand that there is freedom, that there is deliverance, and it comes from a man named Jesus. In Jesus' name, Paul cast the demon out of this girl. And in Jesus' name, you can find the same kind of freedom that she found, and she became Paul's second European convert. I love that. I love those two stories back to back about Paul's ministry in Europe. Started out with a respectable businesswoman, Lydia. She could get saved. And then we went all the way to the other end of the spectrum, a despised, demon-possessed slave girl. And she could find freedom from the demon and get saved as well. You know what that tells me? Nobody is beyond God's ability to reach them and to transform them and to change them from the inside out. I love that story.